Hello guys, in this lecture we're going to be talking about some classroom behavior management um, strategies that you guys can use to decrease undesirable behavior. So if you have a kid that's engaging in <laughs> an inappropriate behavior and it's occurring too often, these are strategies that you guys can employ to decrease that undesirable behavior. Okay, so we're going to talk about some general strategies, uh, then we're going to go into extinction. And then we're going to wrap it up with positive and negative punishment. So just some general classroom behavior strategies that you guys can use if you have a kid that's engaging um, in an undesirable behavior too often is that you can do some planned ignoring. So you can simply just ignore the child's behavior. Now, when you if you decide to do planned ignoring, then it really only works on behaviors that are maintained by attention. So you know, this whole chapter, we talked about um, doing this function-based assessment and developing a behavior intervention plan and things like that. So if you do your function-based assessment, um, you're going to, if you guys remember, you're going to identify your target behavior, you're going to measure it, um, and then you're going to do this analysis to figure out the ABCs of the behavior. So what's going on in the environment before the behavior occurs and what's going on after the behavior occurs. Um, and determining the consequence is what we call the function of the behavior, so why the behavior is actually occurring. And you're, after you do your ABC analysis, you're going to look for patterns in their data, and you're going to hypothesize the function of the behavior. Is it because they're getting attention either from teachers or peers? Is it because are they engaging in the problem behavior because they get out of something? So escape from um, teachers or peers or a tangible item or a worksheet, things like that. Um, plan ignoring really only works if the, um, the function of the behavior is attention. So if the behavior is main, maintained by attention, if they want attention, then you can use plan ignoring and it's very, very effective. Um, proximity control is just you simply <laughs> um, walk and you are in closer proximity to the learner. Um, so either you're standing right beside them or something like that. And sometimes just your presence can decrease that problem behavior. They know you're watching, you're right there, um, and a lot of times it decreases it. And if you guys think about the other lecture that I did, um, increasing desirable behaviors, uh, we talk about negative reinforcement. And that's actually, I would say proximity control is probably a negative reinforcement procedure in that when you get close to the child, there's kind of this threat that they should be behaving correctly. And so to reduce the threat, they will probably engage in the behavior, engage in an appropriate behavior, and then you move away. Um, signal interference, that's essentially when you give some type of nonverbal cue for the child to stop engaging in the inappropriate behavior, whether it be um, a glare or eye contact or, um, I don't know, maybe you have rules in your classroom and you, hand, you hold up um, a number one or a number two to make them aware of which rule they need to be following. Um, those are all those signal interferences. Um, you can use redirection, where you simply um, redirect the child to or the learner to a different task. Um, you can remind the learner, hey, Johnny, make sure that you're doing your math homework. Um, I use redirection all the time with my kid. Um, <laughs> she's starting to, um, she can't really talk yet, but she's starting to figure out toys, and then she gets really frustrated. And so when she starts to get frustrated, I'll say, Carly, and she'll look at me, and then I'll say, let's go play with the picnic. Um, and so she'll start running to the picnic toy and play with that toy. And it um, avoids any type of additional problem behavior that I have with the previous toy. <clears throat> um, and then you can do tension reduction. So a lot of times when you have behavior problems, um, you start to get nervous. The kid gets nervous and the tension just increases and increases. So um, you can reduce that tension by being funny. Um, humor works actually works really well with kids with EBD um, and kids with behavior problems. You just kind of make a joke about what they did. And a lot of times um, they start laughing and you start laughing. And it kind of, um, we have this thing in behavior analysis that we call behavior momentum. So behavior gets momentum and momentum and momentum. And um, if it's a good behavior, that's awesome. Um, if it's a problem behavior, that can be really destructive. So you reduce that tension, stops the movement of behavior, and you can kind of get a handle on things. But a lot of times just making a joke about the behavior or, um, you know, making a joke in general just reduces that tension and decreases those inappropriate behaviors. <laughs>
Okay, um, another thing that you can do, which is very similar to the plan ignoring, is what we call extinction. So in the other lecture that I did for this class on um, increasing desirable behaviors, we talked about reinforcement. So um, the kid engages in the behavior, you provide a consequence, um, and that the future probability of that behavior will increase if it's reinforcement. With extinction, you are going to decrease a behavior by not presenting the reinforcer. So um, if we go back to our plan ignoring, if a kid is um, shouting out things in class and the function is to get attention from the teacher, then the teacher is no longer going to provide the attention. So the reinforcer was the attention from the teacher and the teacher is no longer going to provide that reinforcer. Um, if the child's behavior is maintained by escaping from the task, then you're not going to provide that reinforcer and you're not going to let the child escape from the task. So really looking back at that function-based assessment, figuring out what the function of the behavior is, why it's occurring, um, what's the reinforcer, and then not providing that reinforcement will cause the behavior to decrease. Um, now I want to point out one thing with extinction is that a lot of times with extinction, um, once you once you implement an extinction and you are no longer providing that reinforcing consequence, what you typically see is that you get an extinction burst. So um, this is where the behavior actually gets worse before it gets better. So let me give you guys an example. Think about Coke machines. You go in, you put your quarter in, and you get a Coke. Next time you see a Coke machine, you put a quarter in, you get a Coke. Positive reinforcement. Um, your response is putting the quarter in. You get your Coke, something gets added to the environment, you get a Coke. Next time you see a Coke machine, you put the quarter in. So positive reinforcement. Um, and if you guys think about what happens when you go up to the machine and you put your quarter in and it doesn't give you a Coke. A lot of times, for most people, um, you get, so that reinforcing consequence is not being provided. And what we typically see is that the behavior is increasing, will increase before you go away. So you will push that button multiple times, um, you might shake the machine, you might kick it um, before you actually figure out that it's not going to give you your coat and you leave. So that's kind of a really good example of an extinction burst. So what we see is that um, the problem is going to get worse before it gets better. And you, with the behavior, you're going to have an increase in frequency, duration, or intensity. And then you might also get some novel behavior or emotional behavior. So if you think about your Coke machine, um, pressing that button is your behavior. So when it doesn't give you the Coke, it's going to increase in frequency. You might hold the button down longer. You might push the button more intensely. Um, all those things happen with the response. But then you'll also get that novel behavior and that emotional responding or aggression. So you might kick the machine. You might shake it back and forth. Um, those are all novel behaviors and emotional responding that you get. So keep this in mind. Here's a graph of the length of time a child is screaming. And this is during baseline. So um, one day the child screams probably about six to seven minutes per day. So you're going to implement extinction. <clears throat> so we are going to assume that the problem behavior is maintained by attention. And like I said previously, this is where that function-based assessment comes in. You're figuring out why the behavior is occurring. Um, and then you're not going to provide that reinforcing consequence. So we have figured out that our problem behavior is, um, the function of it is, is attention. So it's maintained by attention. So we are going to implement extinction. So the child's going to cry and we're not going to provide attention. And you can see that on day six, the first day that extinction extinction was implemented, that the crying went way up. You're getting eight minutes. The second day, it was 10 minutes. And then it's going to start to go down. So you see this extinction burst right here, where the problem is going to get worse before it gets better, <laughs> and that you have an increase in frequency. Um, and right here, there's probably some novel behavior. Instead of just crying, there might have been some hitting or kicking or things like that um, And that before the behavior starts to decrease. <clears throat> Now, keeping this in mind, you have to be really careful when you implement extinction because you have to realize that there probably will be that extinction burst, and you have to make sure that you don't reinforce the behavior during the extinction burst. So if this crying gets worse, say day two, and you start reinforcing with attention here, well, you've actually just now reinforced 
um, an instance of the problem behavior that is way worse than it was when you started. So a caveat with extinction, only implement extinction if you are aware that there's going to be an extinction burst and if you can get through it. If you think there's a chance that you're going to reinforce the behavior if it gets any worse, then find another way um, because you don't want to be reinforcing a more problematic um, instance of the problem behavior than you had before. You want the behavior to get better, not worse. Um, and with this extinction verse, a lot of people think that extinction doesn't work when the behavior gets worse, um, right, at, right when you implement extinction. But just realize that's part of extinction. You get that extinction verse, so it's going to happen. Um, and you know, in the real world, we have this as well. So um, if you guys have ever broken up with somebody, and they just blow up your phone with text messages. Um, that happens. That's an extinction burst. They've been texting you in the past when you guys were together, and you've been responding, so you've been reinforcing their texting. And then you guys break up, and you're not responding to their texts anymore. Well, you're going to get this huge influx of texting. You're going to get that extinction burst. And if you respond when they're texting you a lot, you guys will probably realize that it probably maintains for longer because you've now reinforced um, um, a worse aspect of the behavior. Um, so best thing to do in that situation is just don't respond and eventually the text messages will decrease. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about punishment. Punishment is very similar to reinforcement, except for instead of the future probability of the response increasing, it's going to decrease. So I'm going to give you guys a similar technical definition. We got the process by which a stimulus change that is contingent on a response decreases the future probability of that response. And we've gone over a lot of this with reinforcement. So um, remember process, it's the whole process of punishment. That's what we mean by punishment. It's a process, not just the aversive stimulus. Um, um, stimulus change means the presentation or removal of a stimulus. So same as reinforcement, when we talked about with this aspect being positive or negative, you also have positive or negative punishment. Um, the stimulus change is contingent on a response. So the stimulus change, whether something's added or removed in the environment, is contingent on the behavior happening. So it occurs after the behavior, and it only occurs when the behavior occurs. So it doesn't rarely occur, it doesn't occur all the time in the environment. If the behavior occurs, then this consequence or the stimulus change occurs. Um, and so you get that contingency, that if-then relationship. Um, the response, remember that we punish behavior responses, not people. So we're not going to say that we're going to punish um, little Susie or Sam. We punish a, a specific behavior that they engage in. And then your key aspect is that it decreases the future probability of the response. So um, if the response decreases in the future, then we refer to it as punishment. Um, if it doesn't decrease, then it's not punishment. So remember, we're always looking at the effects on behavior. Um, if the behavior increases in the future, reinforcement. If the behavior decreases in the reinforce decreases in the future, then it's punishment or possibly extinction. Okay, so punishment. Um, once again, you can have positive punishment or negative punishment. Um, and each of these, a response occurs. Um, and same as positive or negative um, reinforcement. With positive punishment, you have something added in the environment after the response occurs. Um, so an aversive stimulus is presented. With negative punishment, something is removed, and that's where the negative comes from. So a response occurs and a stimulus is removed. And in both of these, um, positive and negative, the response is going to decrease. Um, so similar response occurs, um, differences, positive punishment, something is presented, Aversive is presented after response occurs. Negative punishment, something is removed after the response occurs and results in the future probability of the response decreasing. So example of positive punishment. Um, uh, kids fight over toys. The parents spank the kids and the fighting decreases. Um, and once again, spanking only works if the behavior decreases. So um, if you spank your kids and the the kid is still engaging in the behavior is not punishment. The behavior has to decrease. Um, and usually this stimulus that is presented, like I said here, is aversive. So think back to reinforcement. Um, with reinforcement, the stimulus that is presented is something that the person likes. Um, it's a positive stimulus. 
whereas with positive punishment, the stimulus is aversive. Um, with negative punishment, this, the stimulus that gets removed is actually something that the person likes. Um, and that's a little bit different than reinforcement. So remember, reinforcement, there's an aversive stimulus that gets removed. But with punishment, there's a stimulus that they like that gets removed. So the kids fight over toys, and they have no TV for one week, and the fighting decreases. Um, if you guys have ever gotten your, you come home late, and you, got, you get your cell phone taken away, and so you don't come home late anymore. Well, coming home late is your behavior. Um, you got something you like taken away, your cell phone got taken away, and therefore your behavior of coming home late is going to decrease and you're going to be on time. And you're not going to come home late anymore and refer to as negative punishment. Um, taking away video games, taking away TV, taking away phone um, to decrease a behavior, those are all examples of negative punishment. Okay, so let's talk about some techniques that you can use that are referred to as punishment. So we're going to talk about two with negative punishment. So remember, negative punishment, let's go back. Negative punishment, um, they engage in a response, and something that they like gets removed, so the response decreases. One example of this is what we call a response cost. So when we talk about a re response cost, that means that you remove a reinforcer contingent on a response. And this is, I said it's a reinforcer, so it's something that they like. <laughs> Um, so the behavior actually costs something. Um, example of response costs and just the general real world would be tickets. So you speed, um, you get a ticket which costs you money. So you have money in your account and it gets removed. <laughs> um, and then your the idea is that your speeding decreases. A um, couple of things with response costs. You have to have an effective reinforcer. So you have to have something that that they really like that you're taking away. You know, when we go back to our ticket example. If you have tons of money and you get fined a $25 ticket, and it doesn't really matter. Money really probably doesn't function as a reinforcer for you um, too much. However, if you are broke <laughs> and watching every single penny, you get a $25 um, in like me sometimes, especially when I was in grad school, I have $20 left in my account. Well, I get a $25 ticket and that's huge for me. That's a huge cost to my money. So keep that in mind. Um, whether it's immediate or delayed can also have an effect. Um, so it's more effective if you take the reinforcer away immediately as opposed to delayed. So our ticket example is actually delayed in that you get a piece of paper, um, but you have to actually go and pay the fine. And so it getting taken out of your account and dealing with a ticket is actually delayed. Um, you have to make sure that you don't violate any rights of your clients um, or your learners or your students. So um, you can't take away their lunch, for example. <laughs> and you guys might be laughing, but it does happen. So you can take away maybe a dessert, but you can't take away their actual lunch. So make sure that you don't take away something that's going to violate their rights. And whenever you do this, you really need to reinforce an acceptable behavior. So with all punishment, when you're actually across the board, when you're decreasing a behavior, you need to reinforce an acceptable behavior. And so the child needs to get what they want, just they need to learn an acceptable way to do that. So keep that in mind. Um, we talked about token economies in the other lecture. And so you can actually do this with a token economy. So the kid can come in and he can have five tokens and if he talks or engages in the problem behavior, you can take the tokens away. And if he engages in the acceptable behavior, you can put the tokens back. So if he engages in the problem behavior and you take the tokens away, then that would be a response cost. Um, and that he had the tokens and he wanted them and you took them away. So the behavior cost him something. Um, and, you know, we talked about using play money um, for completing worksheets in the other lecture. Um, you could... You know, he gets money for completing his worksheets, but he could have to pay you something if the kid engages in the problem behavior. So the behavior could cost something, essentially. Okay, um, the other example is timeout. So this is being removed from a reinforcing environment. There are two types of main timeouts, um, exclusionary and non-exclusionary. Um, exclusionary means that um, the timeout is you're excluding the person from the whole room. So you're taking them into a different room. 
Um, Non-exclusionary means that you're still putting, taking them away from the reinforcing environment, but that timeout section is maybe a section of the room or they can still be in the room and they can still see the other kids. They're just removed from that kid, but they're still in the same room. A couple of things to time out. Um, it has to be brief. So, um, you know, even with parenting, you don't want to send a kid to his room for hours at a time. Um, timeouts are not to be used to get the kid out of your hair. <laughs> it's to let them know that they engage in a behavior and it's not appropriate. So it's brief. These are a couple of minutes and it depends on the age of the kid as well. Um, it has to occur immediately following the behavior and you really don't want to, you really don't need to talk to the kid if it occurs immediately. So they engage in the problem behavior, they get removed either to the next room or to another part of the room. Um, when that happens, you don't really need to talk to the kid. And sometimes talking to the kid and explaining it actually provides the kid with attention, which sometimes they want. So immediately just taking the kid, removing them, putting them in timeout is typically what we suggest. Um, make sure the timeout environment is safe. And the key thing with timeout is to make sure that the environment that you're removing the person from is reinforcing. In the new environment, the timeout environment is not reinforcing. So it's not going to work if your timeout environment is super reinforcing. And, you know, think about kids where their parents send them to their room. Well, the room typically has toys and they typically really like it. Um, and so that's not going to be an effective timeout procedure because they want to go to that room. <laughs> they want to go to their room sometimes. Um, so making sure that the situation that they're getting removed from is reinforcing and the situation that they're getting put into the timeout area is not reinforcing. Um, once again, reinforce an acceptable alternative behavior. You always want to allow them to get what they want just for an acceptable behavior. And then with timeout, you never want to use it for an escape maintained behavior. So you've done your, for example, your functional assessment, functional behavior assessment, and you've maintained that the kid is engaging in the problem behavior to escape from the task. Well, you don't want to use timeout because timeout is giving them what they want using timeout. So you're doing a worksheet with them. They engage in problem behavior and you put them in timeout. Well, that's what they want if the function is escape maintain. So they want to escape. So keep that in mind. Don't use it for if the function of behavior is escape. Um, just like you don't want to use um, plan ignoring as well if the function is escape um, because they might be escaping from your attention and if you ignore them, that's exactly what they want. So this is where it comes into play as to really doing that function-based assessment, figuring out what the function is and using that to design your intervention. Um, that's why it's so important to know the function. Wait, you can present aversive stimuli, and this is an example of positive punishment. Um, these are a couple of examples of um, things that have been used with um, a positive punishment or presenting aversive stimuli. And I would say the most common one, especially these days, are going to be reprimands. Um, and you have to be careful because um, a reprimand, so verbally reprimanding a kid or giving a nonverbal cue that's a reprimand of um, that ice declare or um, things like that, they can actually serve as reinforcers. So you have to be careful. So if the function of the behavior is attention, then it doesn't matter if you're providing a reprimand, you're providing attention and the behavior is going to increase. Um, but if you provide a reprimand and the behavior decreases, then it would be um, positive punishment with an aversion stimulus. Um, and these other ones have just been examples of things that have been used. So like lemon juice, a bad smell, a water mist. Um, this is oftentimes used with cats. <laughs> so that's why I have this picture here. Um, they scratch the furniture, you squirt them with a water bottle, and hopefully it decreases. Um, if it doesn't decrease, it's not punishment. Um, mild electric shocks and physical restraints. Um, you have to be really careful of using aversive stimuli because it has a big potential for abuse. So, you know, from the kid's perspective, it's, you know, positive punishment. But from your perspective, it actually stops the problem behavior, and therefore you're more likely to engage in it. And there's a slippery slope when you start using um, aversive stimuli, and that it's very effective. A lot of times you just have to do it once, and it's effective. And you can start to increasing, increase your intensity of the aversive stimulus, and like I said, slippery slope downhill. <clears throat> okay, another type of positive punishment procedure is overcorrection. And there are two different types. 
you can have restitutional overcorrectness, which is right here, the second bullet point. So this involves restoring the environment to a better than previous condition. So say you have a kid who sucks, sticks his gum underneath the desk. So not only does he clean off his desk, which would restore the environment to its original condition, but he's going to clean all of the gum off of all the desks. So now the environment is in a better condition than it was before he engaged in the behavior. Um, if you have a kid that, I don't know, maybe throws food in the cafeteria or something like that, not only do you have him pick up his food, but he stays after and cleans the whole cafeteria. So things like that. And then we have positive practice overcorrection. So this is when you um, repeat the practice, repeat the alternative behavior, but you do it over and over and over again. <laughs> um, so I don't know, you guys might have done this when you misspelled a word um, when you were learning spelling. You wrote that word out 10 or 20 times. So you're practicing the right word, but you're doing it over and over and over, so-called overcorrection. Okay, um, I'm going to end with some ethical considerations with punishment. Whenever you use punishment or um, any type of strategy to decrease an undesirable behavior, you want to use it concurrently with what we call differential reinforcement. And we'll talk about this um, in the next couple of modules. But you want to make sure that you are reinforcing an appropriate behavior. So if you're going to de decrease a behavior, teach a child an appropriate behavior to get the reinforcer. Always collect data. Um, you always want to make sure that if you're implementing punishment, that um, it's being effective. If it's not, you don't want to do punishment. You want to stop doing it. Um, be concerned of any safety issues. Um, make sure that you have lots of training and strict Im implementation guidelines from teachers, therapists, staff, all that good stuff. And especially in the clinical setting on our side, um, we should always have you should always make sure that you review your procedures with other people, that the person agrees to the procedures. So this would be in the IEP meeting and things like that. Whatever your intervention is, um, if it's going to be punishment, the person agrees to that. So keep that in mind. And realize that, especially with punishment, there are some huge side effects of punishment. Um, punishment is very effective. Um, it's most effective if you do it consistently. Um, and a lot of times you only need to do it once and it is super effective. But like I said, several side effects. Um, one side effect is a lot of times you get that kid actually, after you emit punishment, that kid will actually go and do the same thing that you did. And um, we call that observational learning. Um, we talked about Bandura and his Bobo doll study. And he did it. So if you're using any type of, um, especially, you know, spanking or anything like that, then the kid will actually go and spank and hit. So whatever the kid sees you do, um, they're going to go and imitate that. Um, you're their model. So if you're using punishment, they're going to use punishment. So keep that in mind. Think back to our observational learning, social learning theory, theory that we talked about with Bandura. Um, other side effects is that you oftentimes get avoidance behavior with punishment. So if you are a teacher and you're using punishment in your classroom, a lot of times the kids will avoid you. So you don't get those positive relationships that you have between the student and the learner. I mean, the teacher and the learner. <laughs> so they might see you coming down the hallway and they'll go the other way. They'll avoid you. Um, and then also there's this, like I said, slippery slope. The more you use punishment, the more intense you get on your punishment, the more um, <laughs> the more likely you are to use it in the future. So Skinner suggests that you should always use positive reinforcement. Um, always use reinforcement strategies and only use punishment if um, your reinforcement strategies don't work or they're not effective. And we use punishment all the time in the school system. We use it all the time in the general world. So just kind of being aware of that and trying to use reinforcement. Um, it's weird. Even in our relationships with other people, you might find with your significant other um, that you're just kind of reprimanding them all the time and things like that. Um, and so keep that in mind. You want to catch it when they're doing good. Use reinforcement. Um, that increases that positive relationship between two people. And the same with the student and the learner as well. Um, also, the word punishment just in itself has a negative connotation within the public. So as a behavior analyst, and if you're going in there and you're going, you're going to use punishment as an intervention, 
be careful about the way you talk about it. So I had a situation um, where I was in a clinic and they were using time out a lot, which is something that is typically used in the clinic. And um, I said something about, you know, oh, you guys are using punishment. <clears throat> And this is within my field. And I got this huge lecture about how they don't use punishment or anything like that. And so from a behavior analyst, when we talk about punishment, we are talking about this procedural definition that it's this intervention that decreases behavior. But to the outside world, punishment has a really negative connotation. They assume that we're harming the individual, that we're using aversive um, stimuli with them, everything like that. Um, and so although I was technically right because the timeout is um, a negative punishment procedure, it was a really good lesson for me to think about sometimes when we throw terms out, and to us they're not seen as negative, but to the general public they can. And so I would almost guarantee in an IEP meeting if you're talking about punishment, the parents are not going to be on board with it. So just realizing how to talk about it in a way that – to use a procedure to decrease the behavior and not really throw around terms that have, um, terms that are behavior analytic that have um, negative connotations. So just kind of be aware of that. And that's it. All right, guys, um, we talked about some general classroom strategies. We talked about extinction and then we talked about punishment. So um, please let me know if you guys have any questions about what we talked about. And thanks, guys.